times times are changing. Conflicts are increasingly frequent. As a result, isolation and unilateralism are not luxuries we can afford. The cooperation of national governments, international organizations, local and regional authorities, and NGOs is no longer a desired route, but a necessity. The role of cities and regions in the international scene is ever growing and thus is of utmost importance. In this context, city, the concept of city diplomacy has evolved. It can be defined as a tool with which local authorities and their bodies can promote social cohesion, environmental sustainability, conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and post-conflict reconstruction at a global level. The aim is to create a stable environment in which people can live together peacefully in a climate of democracy, progress, and prosperity. Whilst writing the opinion that was adopted recently on the issue by the Committee of the Regions, and through the contacts I had with different stakeholders, I realized that people and local <coughs> communities are tired of suffering as a result of the failure of their central governments to initiate dialogue when there is a problem. Local authorities, the level of governance closest <coughs> to the citizens, are aware of people's needs and are best placed to determine and respond to those needs at times of crisis or conflict, and also to anticipate them. This is not to say that with city diplomacy problems are solved automatically or that it functions against traditional diplomatic activities of the state, but rather that it complements the latter. We all recognize that modern diplomacy is not expressed and practiced by national governments alone, and that there is a need for dialogue, cooperation, and coordination at all levels to achieve the objectives of peace, democracy, and respect for human rights at all levels. The COR, the Committee of the Regions, believes that closer cooperation between national governments and local and regional authorities is a natural and necessary route towards more effective procedures and strategies to achieve the, goal, to achieve the goals we set. Some cities and local authority associations are actually pioneers in the field, possessing extensive knowledge contributing effectively in the creation of alliances and cooperations that facilitate and promote dialogue and conflict prevention. The Committee of the Regions, as the competent institution, has an important role to play in this field. It has the capacity to act as a catalyst and to give new impetus to such actions through its own policies by promoting, for instance, the exchange of best practices. Despite the extensive work conducted, there is no specific working model for city diplomacy, and it remains difficult to identify the, ma the main factors for the success or failures of its actions. The procedures for formulating any initiative and act action are complex and demand expertise in the subject, flexibility and sensitivity, as well as the practical element of the consent of the concerned local authorities. There can be various dimensions of uh, city diplomacy. Firstly, 
conflict prevention and conflict resolution, which is what I consider to be the most important element. It is a fact that the root causes and the victims of conflicts are most often local. Secondly, development assistance, because development starts at local level and the greatest result can thus be achieved at that level. Development assistance can often direct to city trainings. Thirdly, there is the economic dimension of city diplomacy, which is two-sided. On one hand, it can attract tourism, foreign companies, international organizations, and international events to the city. On the other hand, the city can export its services and knowledge or enter into partner partnership agreements with other cities. The cultural dimension of city diplomacy focuses on the diplomatic activities of, of exchanging values relating to, for example, uh, freedom of speech and religion. Our seminar today is an example of further two dimensions, networking and representation, as local and regional authorities belonging to international organizations or smaller associations lobby for their interests in the decision-making bodies. The European Union has an immediate interest in seeking the resolution of regional conflicts and other problems that undermine its own security to avert uncontrolled immigration to safeguard its energy supply, but also to promote world peace. City diplomacy is a useful and, dare say, critical tool in this process. That is why, in the broader context of cross-border cooperation and in the European neighborhood policy, there is room for promoting cooperation with the European Commission with a view to considering subjects, policies, and above all, activities that fall within the sphere of city diplomacy. I have actively participated in many conferences on city diplomacy, and what I have seen is clear and undisputable. The determination of local actors in resolving pro uh, conflicts where the national governments lack the we or the tools to do so. The Middle East, Africa, Asia and Europe are areas where such conflicts exist. The solution is not for a violent response, but rather the cooperation to solve the conflicts under the umbrella of globally renowned organizations such as the UN and the EU. Dear friends, I come from a divided country. However, in my country, there is strong determination from everyone to improve our daily life by implementing projects and solving problems that may arise. Division should not leave Cyprus behind in developmental terms. Territorial cooperation is advancing. An ongoing example of this is the Greater Nicosia Sewerage Project, which represents a new dimension of the pre-established system introduced by my fellow speakers here today, Lelos Dimitriadis and Mustafa Akinji. This achievement of the past is the living example of what we call city diplomacy today, much before the term was even invented. I consider both of them pioneers in the field and an outstanding example of successful city diplomacy. Another su a successful project introduced by these two visionaries is the Nicosia Master Plan, aiming at improving the living conditions of all the inhabitants of the divided city of Nicosia and at protecting the cultural and architectural heritage. Today, the geographical project 
project area <coughs> includes the greater Nicosia sewerage system, incorporating both the Turkish and Greek Cypriot sites, uh, community sites. Representatives from all <coughs> communities cooperate in a coordinated manner in a project that is funded by the European Investment Bank and by the Council of Europe Development Bank. At the same time, the new treatment plan of a capacity of uh, 44,000 cubic meters per day will, uh, will serve both communities of Nicosia. 70% of the cost will be co-financed by the government of the Republic of Cyprus and European Development Funds, and 30% by the European Union from special funds for the Turkish Cypriot community contribution. The project will commence in January 2010, and two, ye two years later, the plant will be put into operation. Besides the sewerage services, the plant will produce daily a considerable quantity of good quality treated water, which will be utilized by farmers from both communities for irrigation purposes. Local authorities in Cyprus have proven that they can work together in a peaceful way for the benefit of all. Common problems unite both communities. There is currently progress on talks aimed at solving the Cyprus problem as the second phase of the negotiations have started. The two sides have to overcome differences in territorial, economic, governance and power sharing issues if a commonly agreed solution is to be found. I would like to thank President Godardo for agreeing to organize the seminar as well as the President of the Committee of the Regions, Luke van den Brande, and the whole of the Conference of Presidents for visiting Cyprus recently, gaining a first-hand experience of the situation there. Thank you very much for your attention.